One of the most complicated aspects of being a teacher is deciding how and when to give your students feedback on their performance, how well they're doing, when to correct them, when to praise them, when to interrupt them and send them in a different direction, or when to let them finish. And language teachers tend to struggle with this more than other teachers because every interaction can potentially involve correction. And so it's difficult to make decisions about how much correction is helpful, which types of correction are helpful, and when to give the, help, the feedback that might be helpful. So you have a lot to consider. And I think this is really an art. This is something that you really develop a feel for, and it has a lot to do with your relationship with the learner. So I'm going to share about how I do it and how, what I consider as I go into feedback and the structures that I build when I'm designing my course and planning my lessons to help me give good feedback. And you will have no choice but to make it your own because it's different for every learner and every teacher in every situation, and it's constantly evolving. So there's no way to prescribe. Um, and even reading a lot of research about it, there's no real uh, one size fits all advice about feedback. It needs to happen depending on different situations and depending on a lot of factors in each situation. So there is no one size fits all prescription, but I will give you some factors to consider. These are things that you might want to reflect on. It, it can be helpful to build yourself uh, a little framework on a piece of paper of what you want to consider and to take notes on what you think you're doing well and what you think you could do better in terms of giving feedback and to reflect. And this is a way of helping yourself not make the same mistakes over and over, um, either by not giving feedback when it would have been helpful or by giving feedback at a time or in a way where you realize it wasn't helpful, it wasn't a good idea. And that's okay. It just takes time and we are all constantly learning and we're always calibrating. I'm always calibrating to maybe give more, maybe give less. So this is not something that we can prescribe for you exactly, but it is something that you can see the common threads of and predict certain outcomes of once you know a situation well. So once you know your situation well, this framework will help you to make better decisions within that. So I suggest using it as a sort of reflective journal and making plans slowly when you have time, when you have mental bandwidth to slowly adjust your approach in a sort of experimental fashion and see if you get the results you're hoping for and then consider the factors that played in to getting or not getting those results. Again, it's really complicated, so don't expect to be perfect at this and don't expect to come to a solution that's exactly the same as any other excellent teacher would come to. Excellent teachers can totally disagree about this. It's very stylistic and again, it very much happens in relationship. The closer a relationship, the more authentic a relationship you have with each learner, the better you'll be at this and the more effective your feedback will be overall. So no matter what feedback you give, it will always go over better if you have a more authentic relationship with your learners. So always make that your first priority and then analyzing feedback and thinking about your techniques as a second priority. There's a metaphor that I always use when talking about the teaching of endangered heritage or minoritized languages. And it really applies to all languages when you're the language teacher, uh, especially if you're not in the situation where the language that is your target language is dominant in the society around you, which is most of you. Um, I, I always come back to this metaphor and I, I think it's really something that's helpful to think about, this metaphor of the language being a plant and that plant has a natural environment where it grows and varies and becomes wild and lives in an ecosystem. <laughs> um, and we are attempting as language teachers to grow almost the same plant, the same plant in a pot, which is not the same as a natural environment. It cannot be. It cannot be the same. And as a result, we do, of course, find that the end product is a little bit different, but it should be totally recognizable, if not indistinguishable, from the plant that grows in the wild. We want it to flourish. We want it to go crazy. We want it to morph and mutate and grow and have a life of its own. But in order to do that, we have to provide a pot where it can grow. And that pot has to be full of rich nutrients. So this is the metaphor. In the wild, plants grow where they have their nutrients, where, where the soil is already ready for them. 
we as teachers have to create a soil, have to create a pot in which they can grow. And, and, it, and because we are lacking access to that wild environment, we have to provide a perfect balance of nutrients and a really healthy, robust balance of nutrients so that the plant will be willing to grow despite the modifications from its wild environment. So again, in this metaphor, I think of the, the language as the plants that we can't grow a wild language. We can't create a wild language um, because we aren't in that exact place and time and society and context in which the language naturally grows. But we can create a very close prox approximation of it and we can create something that has all the same features. We can create the same type of language. But in order to do so, we have to get the right balance of nutrients into the pot. And so feedback is a cornerstone of language acquisition. We've talked about the three Fs, and we'll continue to talk about the three Fs of usage-based language acquisition, form, function, frequency. But actually, there's a fourth F. The fourth F is feedback. And that's actually, I'm not making that up. That's in the research about how even babies learn their first language, even monolingual babies, need feedback from adults to let them know whether they're on the right track. And so your learners are not babies, they are not growing in the wild, but they uh, are gonna grow in the pot that you provide and feedback is going to nourish them. The trick is that it's a more sensitive situation, it's a more delicate balance. In the wild, the, the plant will grow in most circumstances, it can overcome a lot. In the wild, a language will persist through many, many, many challenges and hardships. But when you're trying to create this artificial environment, when you're trying to grow it in a pot, it's much more sensitive and it's really easy to kill. So we need to nourish that and feedback is a, is a place where we can easily mess up and not provide enough, provide too much, or not provide the right type and timing of feedback such that it nourishes rather than so let's talk about what feedback can look like in your own customized uh, situation in terms of uh, guidelines that you can follow. So the first aspect of feedback is whether the person getting the feedback will even be able to understand it. That's the first thing we need to, to correct. So if you teach your students a couple of phrases using construction grammar and they for example, this is their first day in the class, and the way that they pronounce one of the words changes its tense. Well, we're probably not ready for tenses on day one. So we probably don't want to go into a big examination of that, and we may, not, we may just even want to let that fly. That calculation gets a lot more complicated as they go on in their learning. Is this uh, error that I'm about to correct something that they're about to learn anyway? that they are ready to understand because they have a framework for it. They, they know where it fits in their understanding of the language. Or am I correcting something that's kind of perfectionist? It's really high level and they're just not ready to tackle that yet. And that requires a lot of reflection and discipline on the part of the teacher to decide whether this error falls within either what we have been learning or whether it's reachable for the student, meaning it's in their ZPD, their zone of proximal development. It's in that layer just above what they know, such that if you give it to them, they can get it because they can build on what they know and they can get there. It's not too far away, uh, but it's a little, bit, a little bit beyond what they know and that's why they made the error. And that is gonna tend to depend, number one, on what you're teaching in the class, but number two, on each individual student. Some students are going to be having a better time and moving along, progressing more quickly, and they're going to be ready for correction um, or feedback that's a little, bit, a little bit beyond where they are now, and they're ready to move on to that next concept and give it a try. And other students in the class are not. They're struggling with what you gave them, and they just need to focus on that. So this is actually going to be really individual. So the first thing I do is decide whether the error that they've made falls into their known uh, skills in the language or just above in their zone of proximal development. If it's outside of that, I'm going to let it go because we'll get there. But if it fits, then based on the situation, I might provide feedback. The next element is the effective filter. 
the effective filter is something that you have perhaps read about if you've read about language acquisition theory. It's a metaphor. It's not a literal filter, but it's a metaphor for when we become overwhelmed and we kind of shut down. So when we become very stressed or when we have a lot going on in our lives, it's harder to take in information. And we've all experienced that in extreme situations. Like for example, if you've just lost a family member and then someone starts telling you about how they went to the car wash and then the person didn't detail the car the way that they wanted, but you just can't even, absorb, you're just, you're like, I'm not in this place right now. I don't have space for this right now. And that happens on, that's an extreme example where you've had an extreme drain on your attention. You're in a very bad place. And so information is not working for you. It's not going in and out for you the way that it normally would. But our learners experience that even on very small scales. So for example, if we're explaining something and it's fun, they're often getting it, they're following along. If we make a harsh comment or we bring up something that they're uncomfortable talking about, what you'll notice is that what happens in that moment and the next moment is often either not remembered or misremembered. Um, it's often happened to me that students will get quite upset about something that happened in class and either come to me to talk to me about it or they will write about it in a feedback form after the course is finished. And they will say, um, if this was really messed up. I didn't like this part. And what I'll, and what I'll initially say is, that's weird because that didn't happen. That isn't how that happened. That isn't what we said. And if I think back, very often that time that they misremember or misinterpret happened right at the same time or after something was brought up that made them really uncomfortable. Either maybe a political issue that they have really strong feelings about and they thought, oh no, people are gonna disagree with me now. I'm gonna be put on the spot. Or maybe a personal issue, like they got a phone call from their kid that seemed a little stressful. Or for example, I made a, a, a remark and my tone of voice got a little too harsh or a little too, maybe I sounded a little bit like I was mocking them. Um, certainly, I never mean to do that, but it, you know, sometimes it happens. Um, I, even I just, I, I think it's going to be fine when I say it. And then when I hear it, I think, oh, that sounded a little bit rough. And if they, t if they pick up on that and they feel that, they're often going to be a little shaken for the next few moments. Even if they sort of cognitively know that I probably didn't mean it and it's probably fine, it can upset them or embarrass them and they can kind of shut down for those couple of minutes. So this can happen on a very small scale. But the impact of that small scale can be that they are then blocking out something that happens next. Same deal with um, a repeated comment, a repeated correction that feels like an attack just really feels sensitive for people just really feels like it's coming from a bad place or it's touching on something that really shouldn't be commented on for example if it's a little too personal if we offer the feedback even if the feedback is clear and understandable and, and correct and justified often the person will misremember or just completely block out what's being said because they have a lot of feelings about the fact that it's being said this is the effective filter going up. A filter is going up and information is being filtered. It's not getting through. And this impacts learning. If this happens a lot, it impacts learning a lot. But it will always happen to some little extent. It's, it's, it's not something that you can really control. Because also effective filter can be happening from within someone. They can just see someone's yellow shirt think about the yellow shirt that was on the floor in their bedroom this morning, think about how their mom yelled at them to clean their bedroom, think about how that's so unfair how she yells at me to clean my bedroom, and now they've missed several minutes of the class. <laughs> now they've, they're, they're, they're grumpy and they're out of sorts and the next five minutes are not going to really process very well with them. So that doesn't have anything to do with the teacher mistake, but it impacts the learning. So effective filter can come from a lot of places. It can happen in a lot of ways. And we always just want to be mindful of it. And any time that we can lower the effective filter by having fun, by getting people really engaged, by having people feel really confident, then we can know that in those moments, learning is good. So we really try to work on not stopping the effective filter from coming up because that's often out of our control, but really working on moments and activities and experiences that really bring it down. And so when we are thinking about giving feedback, the question with effective filter is, 
is this going to feel like criticism? Is this going to feel bad to this student? Are they going to feel like they don't get it? Like they're dumb? Like we're mean or we don't like them? Are they going to feel like we didn't even hear all the good things they did and all we did was focus on the bad things? Um, any of those outcomes, even if it's just in their perception and, and we don't agree with that perception, are going to cause them to block out the information, even if it's just for a moment or two. And so we, we need to think about that. Is this something where they're ready and open and feeling good to receive the feedback and they're going to take it in the spirit of help? And they're going to say, oh, yeah, that's how you say that. Oh, yeah, I knew that. I knew it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Or are they going to say, yeah, that's what I said. Or are they going to feel like, okay, well, I tried. I guess what I said wasn't clear, so never mind. That's effective filter. We often have other names for that that are really judgmental. We say, oh, this person just gives up so easily. This person has an attitude. This person always wants to be right. We put a lot of language on it that's very judgmental. And frankly, that doesn't help us at all. There's nothing to be gained from that approach. What is, what is helpful is to think about the effective filter. It doesn't really matter why the effective filter is up, although we might want to look at that and control it as much as we can control it, but we can't always. So it doesn't really matter why the effective filter is up. We need to recognize when the effective filter is up and we need to tr think of strategies to bring it down. And that is not something that we do directly by saying, Sarah, it seems like you're upset and you're not learning right now. What can I do to make you less upset? That's kind of an extreme situation and, and should only be done if you have a good relationship and certainly wouldn't be done in front of the other learners, right? That's not necessarily the way that we're going to go. But we will see that people are getting a little frustrated. Somebody's feeling a little bit put down and we'll look for a chance to put them up. We'll look for a chance to give them something to do that they're totally confident in, get them back on their game. And a, so again, you need the information from the relationships with your students. This isn't something that you can just scientifically prescribe. You have to know these people and you have to be feeling it out and trying it out. The next aspect to consider are the social pressures. So this ties in with effective filter. One of the big things that causes an effective filter to go up is when people feel embarrassed, they feel put on the spot, they feel called out in front of their peers. Um, that is of course never good for learning, <laughs> nothing to be gained from that. Um, so we have to consider the social pressures in the group. This may be a very supportive group. This may be a group of kids who are all having fun and making mistakes and they don't mind and they keep trying. It might be a group where there's competition. It might be a group where there's judgment going on. And it's really important with endangered and heritage languages to think about whether there's something called identity threat going on. Identity threat is a, is a very special type of social pressure where making a mistake or not knowing something is going to be read either by me or by the people around me as meaning that I am not a legitimate member of my group that I identify with. So the most common example is when someone is part of an indigenous nation. For example, they identify as Dakota. If not knowing this or making a mistake is going to, even just in my mind, make me feel like I'm not really Dakota, that's what we call identity threat. And it's too much. It's too, the stakes are too high. <laughs> and so as language teachers, especially as heritage language teachers, we really need to find a way to create situations where that is not what's at stake. And that unfortunately is really hard because learners come into the classroom with that baggage. They come in with those ideas. We don't have to create those ideas. Certainly we should not create them, but we can't always just fix them, wave them away with a wand. So we have to actively work on the idea that one can be a good Dakota, completely Dakota and not know this word. One can be a good Dakota, completely legitimately Dakota and mispronounce something. Um, but we need to figure out how we're going to present that. So we need to think about what are the social pressures that are in the situation that's probably different for each group as well as for each individual learner, certainly different across languages. There's lots of variation, so depends on your context. And then we have to remember that the best motivation, the most effective motivation that someone can have for language learning is integrative motivation rather than instrumental. We talked about that earlier. 
so the instrumental is I want to get a good grade. I want to pass this class. I want to get the credit so I can get into college. I want to be qualified for a job. And integrative is I want to be part of something. I want to be a member of the community. I want to be in relationship because of my learning of this language. That's why I'm doing it. And that is the ideal scenario. That's the strongest form of motivation. That is also something that will get taken away, that will get crushed and stamped out if those social pressures take a negative turn. So when we give feedback, we wanna be mindful of those and give feedback accordingly. If this person can take it, if they're in a good place, if this is the type of feedback that they are expecting and hoping to get, great. If giving this feedback at this time in this way is going to trigger those social pressures, going to cause them to be made fun of, bullied, or just feel embarrassed, or feel delegitimized, feel ostracized, then we will treat that feedback differently. Because at the end of the day, it may be that they pronounce the word wrong. It may be that they use the wrong tense, but it's not worth it if it's going to drive them away from their language learning journey. So these are just things to think about. Is it worth it, first of all? And second of all, which techniques, which way of giving feedback or which timing of giving feedback is going to work best? with the social pressures that I have and the integrative motivation that I want to foster. Next, of course, are two of our best friends, the three Fs, form and frequency. So we wanna think about the fact that when we, know, when we know what someone means, that means the function has come across. We know what they were getting at. We know what they were going for. I often refer to this as clarity. I get what you were trying to say. Communication usually can happen. However, we may see that there's a problem with the form. For example, mispronunciation or a grammatical mistake or a conjugation that didn't happen. That's a form problem. We didn't get the right form across. And there is, of course, a difference between what a language teacher can decipher and understand and follow along with and what a speaker can. And so we need to think about providing feedback that will allow you to speak clearly and successfully with speakers of the language out in as wild of an environment as we can provide you, not just what the teacher can decipher. So that is usually an impetus to give feedback and to try to really make sure that things are coming out clearly. Clarity is really important. And the other impetus for giving feedback is that, of course, we learn by frequency. So the more that we hear something, the more that we say something, the more that it sticks. Universal truth of language learning that we all know. It can work against us. If someone gets in the habit of pronouncing something a certain way or saying something a certain way and they do it 100, 200 times, it's going to stick. Even when it's explained to them that that's not how it is. They're going to feel this sense of disbelief and they may accept the correction or they may not, but they're definitely going to be stuck with their original form that they practiced. And so we want to prevent them from having the wrong kind of frequency. You can see this all over your first language. If you look even at monolinguals, um, if they spent their whole childhood saying paschetti, then it's really hard to get them to learn to say spaghetti. <laughs> um, if they've said their whole life, they've said, I could care less. I could care less. I could care less. And then you tell them, well, that doesn't even make sense. Think about it. It's obviously, I couldn't care less. First of all, people will say, oh, what? Yeah, I guess so. But second of all, they will continue to say, I could care less because they've been saying it their whole life. So we don't want this to work against us. So we, we want clear form and we want frequency that is positive frequency, not negative frequency in terms of what they're practicing. So we don't want to let errors run wild. Construction grammar is another important piece of this example I gave about saying, I could care less. Um, there's lots of these phrases that we say. And if you think about it, that's not the phrase. <laughs> or, or you'll meet someone in life who says the same phrase for the exact same function, but they say it with a different word that sounds similar. And then you suddenly think, am I wrong or are they wrong? Right? That happens a lot in our, even in a monolingual context in our first languages. Um, and the reason is that we know what the function is at this 
scenario, I say these syllables and it gets this meaning across. We know the function. And slight variations on it can often still achieve the function. So a slight variation on the phrase gets the job done and persists and people keep using it. And so we want to think about that, uh, that the importance of that type of learning when we give feedback, that if it fits into a phrase where the meaning is clear, even if there's a little twist on it, then we might be able to hold off on giving some feedback until a better time or in a better way, because with the use of language as chunks, the meaning is still coming across, the function is still happening. The other side that has to do with construction, grammar, and feedback is that we want to give feedback using chunks, using construction grammar. So we don't just want to correct a certain syllable. We might isolate it for a second. We might say not to, tha, 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 so they can hear it. That's not to, that's tha. That's fine, but then we got to put it back into context. And we still want to keep them learning the language as chunks in context, um, even in phonemic context, so that the pronunciation is still coming out in chunks. So we might isolate something for clarity, but then we want to give it back. So we want to say, oh, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. We're not going to have, we're not going to have them practice saying, I could not care less, because nobody says it that way. I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. That type of a correction, where they're still getting it all together as a chunk, is still going to be the most effective for them adopting, understanding it, adopting it, and then using it correctly going forward. These might seem obvious, but they're often hard to actually determine. Uh, one is, is the feedback that I would like to give relevant? So this requires a lot of self-discipline because as language teachers, we often become little language correcting robots. And we hear an error and we wanna jump on it, and we hear an error and we wanna jump on it, we hear an error, we wanna jump on it. But that's not always going to be helpful. And so one of the questions that we have to ask before we speak, one of the things we're gonna think before we speak is, is this correction relevant to what we're doing right now? Does it stay focused on this context, on this task? Does it help them do what they're doing right now? For example, if all the key phrases that they need to get through the interaction that we're practicing were great, and they just ad-libbed something that went a little bit wrong, then correcting it probably isn't really relevant to this task because they just ad-libbed it once. We're not, it's not coming back. So is it relevant to the goal that we have right now, the work that we're trying to get done in the language right now? That's a big question. And if not, we're gonna filter it out. And then a deeper question on that is, is this a high leverage correction? Meaning, am I correcting something that's gonna come up again and again and again? If this is a very rare formulation that they put together, a rare sentence that they said, then maybe correcting it isn't as important as if they're, if they're mispronouncing something in the phrase, how are you? If they're mispronouncing that phrase, that's very, very, very high leverage, as well as they um, are going to use that as a pivot schema, right? They're going to say, how are you? How are your brothers? How are your kids? How are your cats? How are your team doing? How are your friends? How are your friends going to get here? They're going to keep using that. So if they're pronouncing how are, how are you, if they're pronouncing it wrong, that's a high leverage phrase. So we definitely want to make sure that the form is correct so that that frequency will be positive. So we think about where is this error occurring? Is it something that's relevant to the task at hand? And is it something that they're going to use a lot? If I'm never going to say this phrase again, or I'm going to say this phrase once a week, it's less urgent to give me the feedback. I, I, can, I can put it off to another time and I can really look for a good time. And I can also think more critically about when it becomes in my zone of proximal development. If it's high leverage, for me right now, it's probably in my zone of proximal development because I'm using a high leverage phrase. That means I'm gonna, I know that phrase, I'm gonna be using it a lot. So make sure to help me do that correctly. And the last consideration is the combination of sequencing and spiraling. So we talked at the beginning about zone of proximal development. Is this something that the learner is ready to learn? They, they almost get it. And once you explain it, they're going to get it. That's good for giving feedback. But then, of course, there is the issue of sequencing. So sequencing is not something that can be universally prescribed. A lot of research has been done into that. Should every, should every language be learned in a certain order? 
There is, of course, to some extent, a logical order in which languages are acquired. We don't start out usually with the most complicated elements, but sequencing is based on your course, your activity, what projects they're doing, the relevance to them at this time, and how high leverage the phrases are. So the sequencing is pretty idiosyncratic to your course. So if this is something that comes now or close to now in the sequence of the course, it's, a good, it's definitely a good thing to give feedback on. But if it's something that you know you're not going to cover for another month or two, then maybe it can wait and you can just note that this is going to be a challenge and cover it then. And spiraling is actually a, a solution. It's actually an alternative to feedback. You can give feedback um, with or instead of spiraling. So spiraling is an and or situation. And spiraling means that you make sure that this uh, item that we're working on, this chunk that we're learning, comes back again, and then comes back again, and then comes back again, and then comes back again, um, in different forms, in different combinations, but they get a chance to learn it, and then another chance to learn it, and then another chance to learn it, so that by the time it's come around a certain amount of times, everyone is getting it, this is familiar, we've heard this before, we get it even if it comes in different contexts or in different combinations. And so spiraling is a solution. If you're hearing an error, you can note that you wanna spiral that information into tomorrow's class and the class after that, and then a class next week to make sure that everybody has a chance to unlearn that error or learn the correct way. But you can also use it, of course, in combination with giving more direct feedback. And spiraling is also something to consider when you're deciding whether you need to give feedback right now. So if you already know that you've spiraled this content tomorrow and it's gonna come up again tomorrow, then you might decide that today doesn't need to be a correction because they'll hear it again tomorrow and tomorrow you can be a little more clear. It's, it's thought not to when you cover it. So you might make a note to self and come back to it then. So these are all different considerations. None of them are necessarily reasons why you can never give feedback or feedback is terrible, but they are the considerations that you go through when deciding if this is the item to correct, if now is the time, and if this is the way to correct it. Of course, there's positive feedback too. Um, and so same thing. If this is something to praise, if now is the time to praise it, if this is the way to, pr to praise it, you you should consider all of these um, elements as much as you can. And now we're going to look at ways to actually give the feedback once you've decided to give it. Once again, I return to the metaphor of our little baby potted plant that we don't want to kill. We don't want to kill, um, but we do need to give the right nutrients to so that it grows and that it grows correctly. So we have to give some feedback, but we don't want the feedback to be crushing, frustrating, superfluous, irrelevant, um, we don't want it to interrupt the practice and discourage risk taking. So here are some different ways that we can do it. Instant nonverbal feedback. This is probably the biggest one that I use. It's the safest to go to, I would say. This one is usually pretty good, unless you have a student who's really struggling, um, then you don't wanna do any uh, nonverbal corrections either. But if the student is gaining confidence, uh, instant nonverbal feedback happens while they are producing. So if we're talking about a spoken context, uh, which is usually when we're able to give instant feedback, they're talking, they're talking, they're talking, and we're saying, yep, yep, yep. And then we say, ha ha ha. So they know by our face that that was, oh, what was that? Oh, we, oh, okay, go on, go on, go on, go on. And I do a lot of this then, right? Oh, like that. So there's encouragement as well, and there's positive feedback as well. Um, if we see them struggle with something and then nail it, we say, I do a lot of that. So instant nonverbal feedback. And the, of course, the huge, huge, huge upside of nonverbal feedback is that you don't interrupt them. You don't interrupt their flow. No matter how valuable the interruption, no matter how valuable the content is, when we interrupt someone who's struggling to speak or putting in an effort to speak, it's frustrating. And it makes them feel tired and it makes them feel like they don't wanna persist as much. Even if they're grateful for the feedback, it's still frustrating, it's costly. 
And so we really need to know that it's super worth it to interrupt them. Um, so nonverbal is a great option to not interrupt them. Um, there's different signals and you can think about culturally appropriate signals for your target language. Um, I, do, I would naturally do a lot of pointing or like, right? But in cultures where pointing is a bit taboo, then I, and I make sure to practice other hand gestures like this or, um, or I might, these kinds of things that help them know. And I try to be consistent. I try to be both dramatic and consistent. So they figure out quickly what that means um, and always give uh, positives if I've also given correctives. Instant verbal feedback is of course well known. I think it's heavily, heavily, heavily overused. I think again, it's very costly when you interrupt someone in terms of their willingness to keep trying, their confidence and how they're doing. And so I think that we really need to be very cautious about when we decide to jump in and give something. And I, and I usually would jump in and give something when the person seems to really be asking for it. So I would make sure that there's been a, a long enough silence that they've struggled a bit and that they appear to be asking me and then I would offer it. The risk, of course, is that as soon as you speak, they may speak and then you may be cutting them off. The upside of this one, of course, is that it is verbal. And so it is the best way, of course, to help with pronunciation, but also for them to hear the construction repeated back. So things like ta, 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 la, and they, they hear the combination as well. So there's a real upside to it being verbal. There's a real cost to it being instant. So we need to decide which, whether this is the best way and whether this is the best time and whether this is the best item to give the correction on. Um, delayed verbal, of course, has the same strength of verbal, but you really also lose something when you delay, right? Which is that I might not even remember having said the thing that you're now saying that I need to say differently. That can be frustrating. Um, finding a time when it's comfortable and doesn't make it feel like it was a huge deal. Uh, it can just lead to a lot of awkwardness unless we've built in delayed uh, feedback to our classroom. In my experience, teachers who build in delayed feedback to their classroom, it's certainly more emotionally comfortable because I understand that I'm going to talk and then afterwards I'm going to be given feedback and so I don't necessarily have the same effective filter response to it. However, often so much time has passed between the time that I said the thing and now your feedback about it that I don't really connect the two. So there's a real risk in the delay as well. Those are all individual ways of giving feedback. I am really partial to group feedback. So having, for example, all of my students try uh, the construction or the interaction and then saying, very good, very good, everyone did great. You know, I'm hearing, I'm hearing something. I'm hearing something that, that, that everyone is struggling with. Let me show you this again. I'm a really big fan of that because it doesn't put them on the spot. And it still provides a chance to reflect. And it doesn't matter whether they remember making that error or not. I'm just teaching the information again. So this is, an, a, in a sense, it's a, it's a very a scaled down way of, of spiraling. Just saying, I'm going to circle back to that. I'm going to cover that again. And I usually would do that too. If I say, group, I'm hearing this error. Make sure you pronounce it this way. I'm also making a note to myself to cover that again tomorrow before they try to use it again. So I, I already... Uh, plan to spiral when I use that. But I really like that. Of course, the delay is a cost, but the fact that it's a group, I think is a huge benefit because the student doesn't feel called out, put on the spot. We don't have those um, social pressures or that identity threat coming up because it's a part of what I'm teaching to the group. And if you feel like it applies to you, great. And if you feel like you did it right, great. I'll be covering it again tomorrow or the next time that this skill comes up. We already talked about sequencing and spiraling. And so those are Factors to consider uh, where this is in the sequence and whether you will be spiraling are factors to consider, but they are also ways to address errors. So uh, if you find that something has gone really well, you might move it out of your sequence because it's, it's mastered and you can move on. If you find that something is a struggle, you might sequence it into, you might add it into your sequence in a spiral fashion so that it comes back more times and there's more chances to practice it. So these are also group ways uh, of 
of offering uh, feedback and corrections or chances to excel at something, um, whichever it may be, according to what you've been hearing along the way. So this is flexible instruction to meet the group's needs. Something that's individual but still provides a chance to reflect as well as a, a safe and comforting um, correction often is peer feedback. Now, of course, you, you may have dynamics in your classroom that make this more difficult, but ideally your learners get along and support one another and help one another. I work really hard to build a culture of helping one another from the beginning of the course that often requires, that always requires some correction later on. So I really teach them, we're all helping each other. We're all helping each other. We're all helping each other. And then pretty quickly, I have to correct and say, we're helping each other, but we're not doing it for each other. Because there's always a few students who go fast and they like to jump in and give the answer all the time. And the other person doesn't even get a chance to try. So I do some coaching then about we're, we're helping, but we're not doing it for people, or please don't help yet. Please don't help yet. Wait until they ask for help. I build in other things. And sometimes I pull the person aside and say, you know, you're doing so great. I know it's hard to watch your friends struggle, but it is actually good for their learning to struggle and to look around in their brain and see if they can find the answer. So I'm going to ask you to just count to five and let them struggle a little bit more. Otherwise, they're gonna get used to you helping them and then they're just going to expect you to be there when they're out on their own, you won't be there. So you're doing great, but just let your friends struggle a little bit more. I do a lot of coaching around that, but there's a lot of helping culture and I usually have a signal, uh, a hand signal as well as a verbal signal um, in, in my classroom to let folks know that it's time to help each other. So if we listen, someone's struggling, 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 let them struggle, and then I'll give the signal that everyone is helping. Everyone is helping. Um, so that builds a, a good culture of trust and non-judgment. Everybody needs help sometimes. Everybody can help sometimes. And then more formally, we do peer feedback. So I like to build this into the rubric of a task whenever possible, but I also actually explicitly teach the giving of peer feedback. I actually have a scaffold that tells them good phrases to say in the language, uh, good phrases to say. And those phrases are always positively focused. So they're always things like, um, you, you didn't quite get this yet, or you're getting better at this, or you, you will get better at this. Um, there's never, this was bad, this was terrible, you embarrassed yourself. It's not like that, but it's a structured way of the understanding, uh, did great, doing okay, needs improvement. So I use some form of the language to build that. Self-feedback is similarly safe. Uh, of course, it's often a little bit less effective, especially if they're a beginner. They often aren't that good at catching their own errors, and that's okay. It's still good to practice self-reflection and giving self-feedback because, again, it builds that culture in the classroom of everybody makes mistakes. Our mistakes are interesting. They're good chances to learn. No big deal. And so I often will build it into the rubric and prompt them to give themselves feedback on something kind of major that they've done, like a whole task or a whole interaction. Then, of course, there's the classic feedback that we all got when we were in school, which is delayed written feedback. You turn something in, you get it back, the teacher has written down, or even you can consider the comment sections on the rubrics that I build to be delayed written feedback. These, of course, have two weaknesses. They're delayed and they're written, meaning that the student often doesn't quite remember what you're talking about or connect mentally to what you're talking about. And then, of course, the written aspect means that it can sometimes feel a little bit too harsh or it can be a little bit overwhelming um, and so those are two weaknesses of this I think although this is the traditional colonial model for feedback I actually think it's the worst option but I do do it um, and I, I just make sure to keep it really constructive or positive because of course if the student has just engaged in a big task and just exerted a lot of effort, it's then really hard to see that there are lots of corrections and then just be left on that and there's no interaction around it. So I, I keep it really constructive to positive. I also invite them to come and talk to me if they have any questions about what's been written or they don't understand or don't agree so that that keeps the relationship open. I will say that it's the most dangerous for your relationship with the student. They can really take things hard, feel discouraged, feel dumb. And so it is a time where I do provide it, but in limited quantities, 
I let them know ahead of time that they're going to get it. And I really stress that they can come and talk to me about it. And then I look for opportunities to have a positive interaction with them soon afterward in case they're feeling a little disappointed or a little hurt or embarrassed about the feedback that they got. So these are different ways that you can deliver the feedback. You have to decide the timing, you have to decide the format, as well as you have to use the framework of other factors to decide which feedback to give. 